Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Read Science. It's your inner fish episode. And uh, welcome. My name is Joanne Manister, a blogger at Scientific American. And we are doing our Read Science broadcast today in conjunction with Scientific American. And we are joined by my co-host, Jeff Schomeyer, and by our special guests, Neil Shubin and Calliope Monoyos, who is also a blogger at Scientific American. So while this is not an Earth Day episode per se, um, our guest Neil Shubin knows a thing or two about digging up bits of the Earth to help us understand our place in evolutionary history. <laughs> Paleontologist and author Neil Shubin and his team discovered well-preserved Devonian-era tetrapod fish fossils in 2004 on Ellesmere Island in Canada and published the results in a landmark paper in Nature in 2006. Uh, I look forward to learning more about this. Currently, Dr. Shubin is the Robert R. Bensley Professor of Organismal Biology and Anatomy, Associate Dean of Organismal Biology and Anatomy, and Professor on the Committee of Evolutionary Biology at the University of Chicago, along with being the Provost of the Field Museum of Natural History up there in Chicago. He has written two well-received books, Your Inner Fish, A Journey into the 3.5 Billion Year History of the Human Body, and The Universe Within, Discovering the Common History of Rocks, Planets, and People. Uh, they have been beautifully illustrated by our second guest, whom Jeff will introduce momentarily. <coughs> Currently, Dr. Shubin is hosting a series based on your inner fish on PBS, and if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. I'll turn it over. Uh, say hi for everybody. Hello. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce Calliope Monoyos, whose name I'm still practicing. She is, <laughs> she is a science illustrator and communicator. She's contributed, I've counted about three and a half dozen illustrations for Your Inner Fish, and she's also illustrated Neil's newest book, The Universe Within. She's a graduate of Princeton University with a bachelor's degree in geology. For 11 years, she worked at the University of Chicago as a scientific illustrator and public outreach coordinator in Neil Shubin's lab. From her blog, I want to read this one sentence of her philosophy, quoting, by creating intriguing intuitive imagery chart targeted to the right audience, scientists can make their research both interesting and accessible, ultimately leading to more meaningful discussions and a more scientifically literate public, close quote. And that's something that we're all about here at Read Science. She writes a blog at Scientific American called Symbiotic, The Art of Science and the Science of Art. And I would suggest you visit her personal website to see a number of examples of her very beautiful and accurate illustrations. Calliope, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. OK, OK. I want to start where Neil began his story, which is the discovery of the fossil of Tiktaalik. If I say that correctly, an ancient bony fish that your team found in the Arctic. Set the scene for the book. Give us a hint of how those fossil fish bones could possibly relate to humans. And then that insight that formed the nucleus of the story that you tell with your inner fish. And then I'll be back with another question. Well, there's two things about uh, the fossil discovery that are relevant. Uh, the first is the fossil itself. But m almost more importantly is the discovery story of the fossil, is how we knew where to look, because I think it's there where the, a lot of the conceptual power comes about. Um, the fossil itself, if I, was, if I was to hold it in front of you, would be you know, about four feet long. The largest one's about nine feet long. Um, you know, you'd look at it and you'd see a head like this. This is the cast <laughs> of, uh, of TikTok. Um, you'd see a head that's sort of a uh, flat head with a pair of eyes on top. Creature uh, has scales in its back and fins with fin webbing. But if you're to look inside the creature, you know, you'd see inside that fin is, you know, an upper arm bone, a forearm, even parts of a wrist. Uh, you have a neck, you know, much like the kind of neck that we have. Uh, thing had lungs and gills. It was a real intermediate between fish and land-loving animals. So, so it tells us a lot about how animals evolved to walk on land. But importantly, when put in the context of all the other evidence that we have, what it tells us is that, uh, you know, we can connect the fossil of this fish to the evolution of our own bodies. So this wrist we see for the first time in Cyctolic and its relatives is something that's become our own wrist. The neck we see for the first time in this kind of creature and its relatives uh, is something that was to become our own neck. 
Um, so it's part of our own story embedded in this fish. But the other part of the story that's really relevant is the discovery story. And, and it's there where the power really comes about because we didn't just like stumble on it. What we did is we predicted where it would be. Um, using the tools of evolutionary biology, using the tools of science of stratigraphy in geology, um, we were able to, 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 to say, well, you know, these rocks in the Arctic, because they're the right age, because of the right type of rock, um, would likely hold this kind of fossil. It took us six years, but uh, we did find it. You've uh, <laughs> you've given me a lead. I may I may come back to my second half <laughs> later because you've given me the other question that I wanted to ask a good lead in, where you had this this very nice and very useful discussion about locating likely geological strata where you thought you might find a transitional fossil, which was something you were actually looking for. So you had this in mind, and you went through this process, this sequence of deductions that helped you locate a rather few likely spots, exactly, with a lot of precision. And I'm thinking as I'm reading that, we don't usually think of paleontology as a predictive science. But that's really what's going on here, isn't it? Well, and that was the power, right? That's the conceptual power, because it's the tools of evolutionary biology that give us the means to predict. You know, we just didn't go to any kind of rock. We went to rocks of a particular age. We didn't just go to any kind of rock of a particular age. We went to rocks that were formed in a particular kind of environment. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a prediction that sure proves the rule to some extent. And what's, what's interesting about Sictolic is that at one level it's utterly trivial. Because we didn't invent new techniques. We were using the same toolkit paleontologists have been using for over a century. Okay, this is just a very vivid example of it. But it's that this this the paleontological method is 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 working every day. You every you know, every week when you read a, a paper like in nature or science, you know, it's using a version of what Ted Deschler, Ferris Jenkins, and I did. But um, you know, and now you, you you keep giving me these great leads. Thank you. <laughs> hey, no problem. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, the other one, you, you're not just looking vaguely for some transition. You had in mind a specific thing, an animal, a type of animal that was going to be your transition that would show you what you were looking for. And now that's the other part that I wanted to get to before this. I enjoyed this story that you told so much because you ranged over so many disciplines. And I listed a few, like paleontology, geology, developmental biology, evolution, cell biology, comparative anatomy, dozens of others. And the challenge of all that, but the thrill, would seem to be how to tell a compelling, coherent story involving all those things. And then that, that led me to ponder, was there a theme for the book? And I want to ask if this is fair. We've had a lot of chances in the last few years to hear about evolution as a powerful idea at the center of things that helps us make sense of all of biology. And that would seem, in a way, to be an overarching theme for this book, is that you are using this idea of common descent every place for everything you're doing. And the entire story that you write about seems to express that. I want to see if you agree, and, and you know, this is an essay question. <laughs> I agree. I mean, it's, <laughs> but I'll give you a longer answer rather than just the I agree. I mean, the whole conceit behind your inner fish, both the both the book and the TV show, because the TV sh the, the show really interleaves disciplines in a big way. It would have been much easier to do a TV show where we're only in the field, you know, mm -hmm. finding fossils, right? But 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 we had to interleave the genetics, the uh, the developmental biology, and the, the field paleontology because these fit together um, to reveal the history inside our bodies. And so the whole conceit, the whole idea behind your inner fish is that 3.5 billion years of history are really rel relevant. One, they're relevant because we can know it, right? The tools of science enable us to reach in the past and see these events in the distant past. But the other piece is that, that history is inside you and me, you know? I mean, every cell, every gene, every organ in our bodies contains that history. And we can unpeel that history. And so when the idea for Inner Fish hit me, and, um, and, and the title came first, actually, um, I, I was like, yeah, I could tell the story of evolution in our own bodies. This whole Tiktaalik story is not some esoteric event in the history of life. It's something that artifacts are embedded in us. And then, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. There's other stories as well. So it became a vehicle mm -hmm. for that. It became a vehicle for telling uh, the story of discovery. I mean, particularly in the TV show, the this, this show focuses very much on how we know, not just what we know, right? How do we know all this stuff? 
We spend a lot of time on that. And there's a reason, because science is a way of knowing, not just a body of facts. And so the philosophy behind the show is to convey that really vividly, um, and also in the book. But the show gave us new t techniques to do with you know, computer graphics and, and talking to A-list scientists who are themselves at the front line of discovery. Um, so that was really the motive. And you know, the other piece of this was, you know, science is a team sport. I'm not the discoverer of Tiktaalik news. Okay, I am one of several people. I mean, and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all the people who I work with. And so I wanted to tell their story too because I'm embedded in a team, and Kathy was very much a part of that team. That mm -hmm. that team extends to visualization. You know, so I mean, so much of what you know had come out with Tiktaalik um, uh, was was because of the talents of so many people from you know the initial field work to the discovery itself, then to the um, you know, just making casts like this, or be more importantly, making casts like this, which Kathy did. <laughs> so thin. She did a blog post on it um, a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, these were really important things. You know, and Kathy spent a lot of time working on this fin. It took months. She could go through the story, but you know, having this changes the conversation. So again, the it's teamwork, and that that's another thing we wanted to convey with the the the, um, the book and the show. Well, so, and even if oh. there. I'm I'm almost done. I'm sorry, but even if there is, you know, sort of this one powerful central idea, the fact that there are, you you've brought in all of these disciplines to talk about shows all of this connectedness, all of this teamwork, the fact that this doesn't exist as a single idea, but there are strings of deductions and implications and uh, discoveries that reach way out. Science is a big big thing now. And uh, you know, someone complains. Well, evolution, pa, like it, it, it's in everything. And you've got stuff that is ranging over all these fields. There's a huge interconnectedness to all this, and it shows it so well. Well, yeah. If you were to visit my lab right now, just outside this door right here, you know, we have a molecular biology lab essentially, and then we have a preparation lab for a fossil facility, right? Uh, and then we have a map room. So you know, all these disciplines emerge, and just what's going on right outside the door here, because. You need those different tools to assess the history, you know, and you know, they become, with the new techniques we have, they just become ever more powerful in working together, you know. So right, I'd Joey. like to um, bring Kathy in the conversation because I would like to know how did you two come together and really to uh, sort of put yourself on the map, I assume, at least for the general public, by illustrating this book, which, by the way, I will say, if people ask for a good book on evolution, this is one, and written in stone by Brian Switek. Those are the two I recommend all the time. So, <laughs> but yeah, Kathy. So why don't you tell us a bit how you how you became involved with this project, and um, you know what what this book has meant for uh, scientific illustration? Because some books do the entire book without any illustrations. So yeah, it's it's unfortunate, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, We're still kids. We need the pictures. <laughs> right, right. Well, uh, by the time this, this book, you know, when Neil conceived of this project, um, I was um, I was several years in his lab and and making my way as an illustrator. Um, uh, and so we had really established a, um, a, a process of thinking about illustrations um, before he would write papers he would sit down and think about what he wanted to convey visually so this was already a part of our process so it was very natural when he conceived of this book for him to start thinking about how he was going to use visualizations um, in the process of um, thinking about what he wanted to write and what he wanted to convey I actually think it's a very natural process he even does it with his lectures you know uh, uh, I don't want to speak for you, Neil, but but my You're my sense a better is, job than I am, so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> my sense is when when he sits down to to think about what he wants to teach his students, the first thing he does is he pulls together a bunch of slides and he's thinking about um, telling a story visually, and then he kind of you know obviously he knows the material so well he can just riff off of the visuals that he's pulled together. So the book was very much conceived in the same fashion. He thought about um, the general topics that he wanted to to uh, to convey to people um, that he found the interesting stories that he thought would resonate with people and then um, it was very natural you know biology is a very visual uh, particularly anatomy is a very visual 
science, and so it was very natural for me to step in um, and work with him um, from the conception of the book to just bring bring out the story through images. We would uh, just to, it's, it's you know just to hone in the um, when we did it, cha any chapter in Inner Fish really began with a rough draft that I'd write, and then I'd give it to Cappy while it was still a, a crummy rough draft, and um, you know and at that time. With the crummy rough draft, we'd sit down and think, where in this, in this thing, wh where would figures work best? And so the the figures came in really early in the chapter. Now, which which meant sometimes we did a lot of figures that we ended up not using because you know you're rewriting the chapter. But um, but in many cases, what happens is text and an image become linked in a very important way. Um, and I learned that from my mentor, uh, Ferris Jenkins at Harvard, who before he even began a scientific paper would work on the figures. You know, figures first. You know, then the text. That was that was the philosophy. And I, you know, we we carry that on every day here. And Cappy was very much part of that enterprise. Joanne and I have had several occasions in these programs to say maybe the common acronym STEM should really be STEAM because we think art would be a valuable contribution to that idea of learning and what makes for a well-rounded person. And it's it's nice to hear you promoting that too and to to integrating those things together. Because it's very valuable. Well, in writing Inner Fish, it wasn't only that. The most important course from my college years in, in writing Inner Fish was a Russian literature course <laughs> that I took in my <laughs> year. And, you know, I took it and it just blew my mind. But I had a teacher who, and it wasn't really the Russian literature per se, but he focused like a laser beam on writing clearly and precisely and, and, and trying to engage the audience. And those lessons stuck with me ever since. And, you know, that's, you know, liberal arts coming back. You know, you never can predict at the time. Oh boy, that was just so huge in my development as a scientist, writer, communicator, and I'm sure everybody has similar. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and it, and it is you stand out. So you know you're a member of a team, but you're you're the one who's the face of the team now because you are able to communicate so well. Not only in the book, but you're also a charismatic and genial personality who can transfer those talents to the TV show. Have you had some particular challenges going from, you know, writing can be solitary to now, you know, being out there in front of uh, cameras and uh, well, mic'd up yeah. and everything? That was a little harder because the TV show was surprisingly difficult because, um, A, it's a, it's a team sport of a different kind. You know, you're having the graphics artist, you have the director, you have the sound people, you have the folks working on scripts, so it comes together in a different way. I should say the one thing that that helped me doing the TV show is everything to camera on the TV show was ad lib, and so that definitely kept it. We know what we want out of every scene, but uh, well, my words weren't scripted, so I could try different things and just and that gave me a chance to be very familiar with the camera, because it's really important in a in a TV show, specific, particularly one like Inner Fish, which has a sort of an intimate relationship with the material and the presenter, that it ha you can't go big in your presentation. It has to be very intimate. It's me talking to you as my best friend, you know, and, and really sharing these wonderful, wonderful um, uh, treasures, you know, with you. Uh, treasures of science, if you will. And, you know, so that was my mindset going in, but that took a little while to get to that place. You know, I didn't know that at all. And it, we had, to, you know, we funked around a little bit, but I was working, I was really lucky working with a good team. And, and I think, like, you know, your years of lecturing on the material gave you such a familiarity. Oh, yeah. That that really it really does come through in the program that you know you are one of the experts in this field and you are able to communicate it well and um, so actually Jeff one day we should do a tally of you know people we've had on this show who are scientists and who are science writers and I don't think that the balance is high towards the scientists like so to have yeah. a scientist who is also a good communicator and willing to write a really good book but you have done a great service by communicating this to you know, the wider world, um, the national bestseller even, so. It helps, it helps keep the balance, and it's, it's very exciting that now we can start talking about scientific art, too, and yeah. bring in the idea of illustration and visual presentation. You look like you're about to do something. You want me to wait? Oh, I just was wondering, I'm just showing an image while I'm talking here. This is one of the illustrations. Many oh. like this in the book. Cappy, were you able to help with the TV show at all, or were you just gave permission for the images, or were you able yeah, to? Yeah, really the, the extent of my help was passing on images that would help them, I think, in their research. But um, they did an incredible job. I mean, what yeah, a, what a team of illustrators and graphic designers they have because it was... Well, you're not being entirely fair. Terrible. They started with the... Your, your images formed the template for a lot of the computer graphics. 
And so what they did is they would take her very simple visual images and then really build them 3D and sort of animate them in a way. But it, a lot of them really began with Cappy's real simple, you know, here's the essence, the you know, the platonic form, if you will, of what we need to do. You know, so yeah. I was very impressed with the animations, and so you know, because you could see them drawing in the structures. And mm -hmm. I hope people are watching this show. It's definitely a recommendation. I teach. Uh, Masters of Science teaching program. So I, it's like my teachers. I'm like, I hope you're watching this show. <laughs> so I have I have a question about the process, the writing process, and the illustrating. It this won't show very well, but this was one of my favorites and a really good example. Oh, of that. This is in my copy of the book. This is from page 163. But you're illustrating the the convergence and how evolution over time has transformed bones in the jaws of precursor animals, fish and, and such, into the bones of our inner ear, which is a surprising uh, sort of outcome, but also an, an intimate story about how evolution uh, development uses material that's already there. And I'm thinking, how did this illustration, it's a very complicated illustration, it shows a lot of complex things and requires a lot of accuracy too in exactly what it's presenting. When, what's the process for that? Where did you say, oh, we need one here, it should show this, this isn't looking right, this is illustrating it well. Who wants to go first? Well, I was writing a chapter on ears and uh, it clearly needed a figure that told the transformational story. But typically what, hap what would happen is I'd go to Cappy and say, here's the text and this is where, this is what I'm trying to say and then she, I think she, that's one, that's a Cappy, she, you ran with that one as I remember. Because it was originally just going to be the reptile to mammal transition, but then you had the idea to fold in the other one, as I recall. But it was about that's about eight years ago. <laughs> but I, I believe that's when you took ownership over, and it's better for it. So. Thanks. Um, well, it, it, you know, as I would read Neil's text, uh, um, I don't know if other people do this, but when I read, images pop into my mind, um, and when something is a particularly visual concept. It just kind of presents itself, um, and so uh, I think that I saw that opportunity. And you know, oftentimes Neil Neil knows the 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 content so well. He would he would come and say, you know, there are these great fossils, and da 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 da, and he'd list off a you know a list of four or five great examples. And um, so you know, then it was it was just a matter of of digging them out and seeing how that transition actually happened and. Um, when you when you get it when you actually do the organization and get it down on paper and it tells such an incredible visual story the the diagram kind of just makes itself um, it's just a matter of 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 putting things in a logical place so that people follow it like they would read a text you know um, so uh, what yeah. source material were you using for for the um, the heads that you illustrate here of various animals. Well, we would pull out um, uh, original papers that were describing these fossils, also um, classic textbook illustrations, um, really uh, a lot of tools that had been used in the past. We were just trying to synthesize them in new ways and, and in ways that made sense that fit Neil's text um, mm -hmm. and, and his audience as well. Uh, one of the things that I think is really critical in, in communicating particularly science to the public, but really anything, is knowing your audience. And um, a lot of times you'll see figures that are repurposed um, from other sources, and and the the that is the piece that's lost. People aren't considering the new audience and what they're particularly trying to say. So a lot of what we were doing with our illustrations for the book was thinking about uh, catering it, tailoring it to the particular, mm -hmm. you know, to to match the text first of all, and to to talk to our specific audience that we were trying to reach. But I'm interested in hearing too that you use um, sources of original papers and such Ooh. which you have to look through, evaluate, understand. You have to draw this illustration that relies on a large number of ideas and as a scientific illustrator you have to make them not only interesting and attractive and all of that, but you have to make them correct. correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and that takes a lot of uh, editorial over oversight too on your part in scientific knowledge to make them right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the difference between a scientific illustrator and just a, a fine artist or a really good 
or artist. a science writer um, or a science TV show. We we have a higher master. <laughs> 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 right, exactly. You you need to know the science or, or be able to at least understand the scientific process and understand you know the level of accuracy needed. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that, that's maybe part of our answer, Joanne. Uh, not every scientist is a writer or an illustrator because they, they take additional uh, skills to be good at those things. Right. And but in it fact starts that's... in a similar way, I'm sorry. It starts in a very similar way in that, just like what Kat was saying, you really need to find the generals. What, 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 what universals, what generals do you want to project? What do you mm -hmm. want your audience to know? You know, what is the core here? And then for a writer, it's finding the narratives to get you there. For an artist, it's, it's designing the visual. For the TV, it's combining music, video, uh, and on camera. I mean, it's, they, the tools are different, but it begins conceptually in a very similar place. What, is the, what are the generals and the, that, that an audience really needs to know? What do you want out of this whole thing? You know, you're revealing some of the secrets of, of artists and, and writers, that it doesn't just happen by accident that they, that they actually do these things by design. Oh. <laughs> no, uh, uh, Kathy, how did you, you know, start as, you know, maybe a young girl? I would assume, you know, artistry didn't just occur to you at 20 years old, right? So you were probably drawing things. Were you drawing things from nature? Would you spend out time outside, or, or how did your path begin to get you to where you are today? Like, you know, uh, you know, what what makes someone a scientific illustrator? Mm -hmm. um, um, it's an interesting question. I have uh, both scientists and artists in my family in droves, and um, the the art was always a constant. You know, uh, whenever we have family gatherings, there's always some craft or art project or something <laughs> going on. So, um, so that is certainly certainly runs deep. Um, and then the science as well. Uh, my my grandfather was a professor. My Actually, both of my grandfathers were professors, um, and um, academia certainly, and science in particular, have have always been interests. So I was always the, you know, I grew up in New York City, but I was always out on hikes, learning about nature and collecting leaves and rocks and shells, and on the hunt for fossils in Central Park, which now, as a geology major and working in Neil's lab, I understand was kind of hilarious. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you know, I had my hopes and, and, uh, and anyway, so, so there is definitely a thread that runs through my whole childhood about interest in geology in particular, paleontology. I um, spent a lot of time at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, mm. So it was all there. It just came together after school when I realized that I wasn't particularly interested in the academic route and I don't think that our um, Maybe it's changing now, but I'm not sure that our higher education focuses on the 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 more artistic sides of science and science communication. Um, I think that maybe now the the tides are starting to turn and people are becoming more aware of the value in that. Um, but certainly, 15 years ago when I was in college, it was it felt like you know you either were going the hard academic route or you were not, and so. Um, I was very lucky to find Neil and and, um, and have his mentorship as as I learned that science communication is a viable career and a certainly a valuable one and very fulfilling. <laughs> so, and I appreciate uh, your blog, which you run with Glendon and um, what her name is escaping. Katie McKissick. Yep. Yeah, so, you know, it's wonderful because I learn things I don't even give a second thought to most of the time. Um, I, I am a bit interested in... For instance, this iconic image of Tiktaalik that you drew, I'm sure, has been copied many times. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel when that happens? Is it proud? Is it like, wait a minute, you know, I'm not getting credit? I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm not never in that kind of position. It depends on the way in which it's copied. Um, we have a classic example of, of an image of ours being taken from South Park, which was amazing because South Park is such a cultural icon, obviously. Um, and it was just incredible to have that that recognition. On the other hand, it would have been nice, you know, for the research to be supported in a monetary way, um, <laughs> <laughs> which they did not do. Um, so, so that you know, it, it's a double-edged sword, right? You want to be able to make a living from this, but but it's wonderful when something resonates with the public so deeply that it's um, that it that it gets used. Um, but the other the other side to that is there's an interesting debate, and which I plan on writing about on Symbiotic, um, 
where you know science is an inherently collaborative process, and you touched on that in the beginning. You're always um, leaning or standing on the shoulders of the scientists who came before you, and um, uh, fossils, when you find them, there may, some, in some cases, not in Tiktaalik's case, but in some cases there is only one specimen that represents mm -hmm. an entire species. And so um, the illustrations that come from that specimen are sort of scientific fact. It's, um, it's what we have come to acknowledge as the facts that we have. And if we find more species, then we can add to those facts. But as they stand, they are fact um, and and the illustrations that stem from those the original illustrator who made those is paying very close attention to the details is working closely with the scientists obviously mm -hmm. um, so the the kind of archetype that they come up with can be construed as facts and under copyright law mm -hmm. facts are not copyrightable right mm -hmm. so um, there's an interesting kind of um, gray area, I would call it, of whether, you know, a, a fossil drawing, a drawing of a, of a fossil that's a reconstruction that we consider a fact that other scientists are going to use in their papers moving forward when they mm. compare other species. I mean, is that copyrightable? Can the illustrator take claim to that um, and, mm -hmm. you know, claim damages if it gets infringed upon? Um, it's a really interesting topic, and it is not it is not black and white, and it certainly hasn't been tested in the courts. So, um, I don't know if anyone else is excited about that, but I think it's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, things are shifting and changing, especially with the internet. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. easily shareable images and all. Um, right. Neil, I would like to ask. So, I mean, really, this is a very recent discovery in terms of science, and certainly in the history of Earth. You know, ten years, right, since you discovered the pretty well-preserved fossil. So how, well, I, I'm not exactly sure how to ask this, but, you know, how big of a discovery is this? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, like anything, science moves on. You know, mm -hmm. there'll be better Tiktaalik's discovered. There's already one that somebody discovered that'll come out pretty good. Uh, it's, um, you know, I mean, I think it, you know, it, there's, again, two things. There's the, the fossil itself, which is there forever. It's a reference fossil now. It's arguably the best preserved of the creatures in this, um, in this interval of time because of a couple things. One, the quality of the material. One, because we have so much of it now, and we can look at it in different ways. Um, we have the environmental context. So I, I think it offers scientists a resource, really, for this transition. But again, the discovery story. I mean, because the toolkit, it really got the word out about the power of the paleontological mm -hmm. method in a way that hadn't before, in a sense. And so I think, you know, uh, I, if, if there's any legacy of the fossil, um, it'll be more about, uh, I would hope, uh, about energizing colleagues and students to get out there and look, uh, because there's still many places to look, as much as it is about the, the origin of tetrapods. You know, so those who know me know that uh, I've been, you know, I'm, I'm always on the next step, and we're launching a whole new Tiktaalik-style expedition uh, this <laughs> summer, not in the Devonian, now this is in the Cambrian. After Cambridge. Cambridge explosion. And so, you know, applying the toolkit again, you know, getting out there and, you know, trying to discover. That's what it's about for me. Well, um, I was going to ask what was the next thing, so it's looking through the... Yeah, moving deeper in time. It's something I've always wanted to do. I've always been interested in, in the question of the origin of the vertebrates. You know, how did our line of, of vertebrate organisms come about? And I love that question because any new fossil evidence can really affect the conversation in a big way. And we believe that, you know, if again, if we're careful about it and we use the same approach, uh, analytic approach that we used in uh, the TikTok devising expeditions for TikTok, that over a period of time will show some success. We'll see. You never know. Uh, we're off to a new place this year that we believe holds hope. Um, but, you know, talk to me in six years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> see how long that takes with yeah, that. Exactly. So um, and, and are there any immediate or what do you see maybe long term about having a TV show that I mean that will be you forever available? Well, I love that because you know one of the responses. So I've been live tweeting it. So we have the last show is the final episode is tomorrow night at ten. Yes, it is. Um, check local listings. Um, but I've been live live tweeting um, the show, and it's really been fun because I get direct questions from students and teachers. <laughs> Classes are watching it, and it's such an effective way to engage. You know. And so I, you know, I come back like Thursday morning after I've live tweeted in the show. I had last two shows of it. I'm so pumped because I've gotten these wonderful questions from students, 
and my inbox has been filled with you know um, with lovely emails from teachers and educators of different levels and um, general public and it really that's the audience you know the general public um, many of whom just haven't had the means to really think about these issues before um, giving them tools to really think about it um, has been it's just really been wonderful um, you know the show took two years to make and so. Yeah. Uh, it was a slog, I got to say. We traveled Africa multiple times, went to the Arctic, and all. Over. Um, so uh, I was delighted to see it come out after two years. Um, <laughs> That's good. Well, I, I love PBS. You know, I can't say oh, enough. Yeah. That, I mean, you know, inspired me when I was uh, exactly. young. So. <laughs> and then their support for the show was huge. So it was great. It's great. Well, it's beautiful. It's amazing. So. Anyone who knows me the way Joanne knows me knows that I have a couple of themes of my own that I always like to talk about in these things. One, one, I'd like to do this with some quotations, and there's some excellent quotations that jump out at me while I was reading. But one is, is about, we were talking about time, and, and they both deal with time, but one is the, the idea of people think, you know, geology, rocks, and things are all old, so that fossils and the way we understand them and the way we understand geology must be old. Now. In the very beginning of the book, on the first page, you say that a column of rocks has a progression of fossil species comes as no surprise. And I thought, well, of course, but you know, that's obvious, that it's obvious is a relatively recent thing, that the strata mean something, that they refer to time, that fossils represent animals that once lived but no longer live. And it, it always seems, it always strikes me as really fascinating that that's something we've only known for. 200 years, a little bit more. Well, Leonardo da Vinci actually was one of them. Um, was one of the first really to think about that. And you know, like most things, he was so far ahead of his time, you know, that we're only <laughs> catching up with him in the last couple centuries. Um, but you know, it, the one of the things that's really important and uh, is that geology, just like evolutionary biology, changes the way you look at the world. That when you're a geologist or you're an evolutionary biologist, you see things differently. Because you're looking inside those rocks to see ancient environments, or just like if you're an evolutionary biologist, you're looking inside bodies to see connections. And again, that was one of the themes in the show that we use graphics to do to show inside the rocks and how landscapes transform and so forth. Um, but that, yeah, those ideas. I mean, those that, those ideas are multiple lines of science coming together over the last century and a half. You know, ideas have long predicates. You know, they've been out there. You know, they've been, they've been, they've been long you know, long precursors. They've been out there for a long period of time, but really they've consolidated through geochemistry, stratigraphy, evolutionary biology, ecology, and all these other disciplines converge really importantly. Yeah, yeah. The uh, this is kind of personal, but the 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 biggest new idea I got when I read it, you know, you said it, I read it, and I go, gosh, I'd never even thought of that before, and it seems so simple. Is you you point out that bodies are made of cells. And the stuff in between cells. And I thought, my goodness, I've never thought of the stuff in between the cells. Well, I wrote that chapter when I was having knee surgery, so I was thinking about cartilage a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff in between there. So actually, segueing from your the cartilage knee surgery, what implication does knowing the evolutionary history of our body have for our health? Actually, I know it's a full field, but yeah, the evolution in medicine. You know, well, the most immediate thing is, you know, when we think of understanding human disease, the best models for human disease often lie in other creatures. And so what we spend a whole lot of time doing in the field of, you know, of, of molecular biology is really figuring out the similarities and differences among genetic and developmental and cellular processes, say, in a fish or a worm or a mouse and a human. So we're doing those evolutionary comparisons to understand how relevant are the are the insights that we gain about diseases in fish to humans, and some you know where the breakthroughs of that are happening are you know fish models of melanoma, fish models of Alzheimer's, fish models of blood diseases, and those are just the fish models. I mean the worm models of cancer and and memory and and other things. So it's really you know um, understanding the workings of our own bodies in ways we can't do because we're not a model organism. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, by uh, by understanding these other creatures, so that that's one of the biggest. Uh, but there's others that I think are just as important. But they're aesthetic. They are not more than aesthetic. They're profound. They're the way we see the world. And that when we see ourselves as part of this beautiful and this is Earth Day, this beautiful set of uh, this is Earth Day coming up. Um, <laughs> you know, the set of interconnections among Earth and life 
and that we're part of an interconnected, you know, branch of the tree of life that's, you know, that it extends over three and a half billion years with connections to the planet, the solar system, and the universe beyond. I mean, you can't help but be marvel at the beauty uh, and the grandeur of that. That that makes me think of one more riderly compliment, and you're just talking about something that is astounding. And I noticed you used the word astounding once that I noticed, and I wanted to compliment you because I was astounded by what you said. You wrote that um, Buck and Angel, Axel, discovered something truly astounding. Fully 3% of our entire genome is devoted to genes for detecting different odors. And I thought, indeed, that's, that's astounding. How nice. So thank you for, instead of just saying yes, everything's astounding, I mean, it's like, I, I read that, I, I can't believe. Why would we waste 3% of our, of our DNA just for things that, can smell individual molecules. It seems like it's such an interesting thing. And you can say something if you want. I was just going to mention that. No, evolution's <laughs> loaded with cumbersome devices that'll blow your mm. mind. You know, I yeah. mean, the plumbing inside our bodies and the, the, the directions that vessels go. It doesn't make sense. But when you look at history, it starts to make so much sense. Things that don't go from point A to point B as a straight line, but go through all these other courses, they unravel. That 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 connection comes often. Uh, begins explained as we see history, you know, and I think that's one other yeah. important Joanne's other it is, it is astounding. Um, okay, I, well, well, okay, we got close to the end. Yeah, yeah I, I just one want more to, quotation. But. I'm going to strangle you, Jeff. <laughs> this one's easy. This one's easy. I was just amused. He wrote um, teeth. We think paleontologists and teeth. And Neil wrote, teeth not only herald a whole new way of living, they reveal the design of a whole new way of making organs. And I thought, well. That's kind of astounding, too. It is. That, but when you understand molecular biology, genetics, cell biology, it's not just the organs that are important. It's the well, toolkit yes. that builds them. You know, it's so the people can read the book, and they will understand what that was about. Yes, and, and watch the show, too. I mean, mm -hmm. they're doing such a great job. I love that you're going into the labs, and you're talking about FOXP2 and, and all of these other things. I did want to ask, uh, Kathy, one last question. What, what have you... Um, what do you feel has been your biggest lesson through all of this or something that has really, really surprised you that you didn't expect to learn uh, during this time, uh, illustrating a really popular book? Um, do you mean in terms of like a, a science story that I learned or, or just sort of a... Science or in general. Uh, just It's, it's an open-ended. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the the... What it has taught me is that there is such a um, a wide open field for for how science can be communicated. Um, we have all these in, we're we're sitting on all this incredible incredible knowledge, and um, I just I would like to encourage anyone who's interested in in communicating science, whether you're on the front lines of the research and um, you know you can think of creative ways to get your research out there or um, you want to work with other people who are like myself, who are not on the front lines, but who are excited about communicating in interesting and and innovative ways. I mean, let's do it. Let's get it out there. It's exciting stuff, and and there's there, the sky's the limit. That's great. That's great. I'd love to see more books with illustrations as well. Neil, uh, the Carl Sagan syndrome. Do you have any comments on that? So that's a, <laughs> that unfortunate syndrome that if you are a popular science communicator and also a scientist, you are taken less seriously as a scientist, which I can't imagine, but we no, do. I don't think, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, we're, we're in a different time period. It's just totally different. I mean, I think hmm. scientists get that really, you know, we live in a social context, and that social context is not always friendly to science. And then if you're trying to get the word out and defend science, or expand the range of people who might appreciate science, I think there's an appreciation for that more now in 2014 than there was in 1978, 79, uh, when Carl Sagan was doing Cosmos. I think it's just totally different. I mean, the um, you know, you look at uh, just formally the National Academy of Sciences. You know, they were one of the factors behind Cosmos, Neil Tyson's Cosmos. I mean, the... Um, They've gone other way to recognize scientific communication in many ways, and you know, and so I think just from the very formal levels, you know, like the National Academy, all the way to um, uh, to just how um, how scientists treat each other who are trying to communicate, and 
and the responses we had from other scientists and with regard to the being involved in the TV show, um, there was never any, you know, really never any question. We were able to get really A-list scientists involved because they saw the importance of getting out there and talking about the work. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think we, we live in a different, in a different era um, than the, the Carl Sagan one, fortunately. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there, there's a reason why we're, we're appreciated more. But, there's, uh, but um, uh, and that's because there are lots of challenges out there. Um, but the reality is I think we are in a much, uh, within science itself, it's a very supportive community with regard to communication. That's great. That's great. Um, I would love to, yeah, I, I would love to uh, offer both of you the opportunity if you have anything you'd like to share with the audience in these last few minutes that maybe we forgot to ask or something like that. And, um, <laughs> and then we will wrap up. Uh, Kathy, do you have anything to add? Um, you know, I don't know if we mentioned this before, but you, if you missed the first two episodes of, uh, of Neil's Inner Fish, um, they, they, you can stream them uh, on PBS. So go to the website and you can watch them there and then catch tomorrow's show at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 Central and Mountain. Yeah, <laughs> I recommend it too. It's a fantastic program. It is, Very well like, done. They did a wonderful Very job. Well. I can say that without any... Uh, any modesty because I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> and Neil, is there anything you'd like no, to add? Thanks, uh, thanks for the wonderful time today. And uh, again, I'll, I mean, if folks want to chat with me with 140 characters or less, uh, tomorrow I'll be live tweeting the show, uh, <laughs> answering as many questions as I possibly can. My son makes fun of me. I'm sitting in front of the TV just typing away like furious. <laughs> 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 That's great. What a, what a role model you are for your kids then as well. So, um, and I'll be sure to promote again. I, you know, it's just been, it's been so good and maybe they'll approach you again for uh, the universe within <laughs> and you'll go, oh wait, I have to do some work. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see. Okay, well, thanks to everybody. Thanks especially to Cappy and to Neil for joining us to talk about this marvelous book, Your Inner Fish. We didn't talk much about his other book, but that one is worth checking out too, The Universe Within, which looks at the interconnectedness of um, everything in the universe to humans. So uh, that's another one to take a look at. So um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jeff, again. It's always fun to uh, chat with you. and. Uh, and to learn more, we learn more, and to talk about science communication in general uh, with the awesome help of Scientific American. So uh, thank you all very much. We will see you again in another episode.